Well, good morning, Brother Chad Long, Del Hot Baptist Church here. <clears throat> this section's about marriage, and uh, I've often thought it was just asinine for a, a young man to go to Bible college and, and spend four to eight years or whatever, depending on how far he wants to go. And you know, you can pretty well you can pretty well follow the Bible as long as some people follow the law or or, or uh, medical school I mean you can go all the way up to a doctorate but I've always thought it was just you know strange for a young man to go to Bible college and then get out and go pastor a church and then feel like he's got the ability to counsel with married people <laughs> uh, I'll just say that and you know I've been with my wife since 2003 been married to her since 2006 and I don't feel qualified to teach people about marriage, especially in our church where many have been married for 50 years or more. So we've got a couple in our church that have been married for 70 years. They should be teaching me. I should be not be teaching them. But fortunately, the Bible does give me some help and, and, and there are some things we can learn and, and I can try to, try to give people some good advice. Now, I am by no means an expert and that was the point. But if you'll forgive me um, a little short departure from the norm I would like to begin with a, a, a joke just to put us in a lighter mood I guess it, it, it made me laugh so if you'll forgive me I'm gonna read this to you this is an anniversary joke for a, a couple who's only been married two years <clears throat> the joke goes like this Bill's second anniversary was coming up and as there was one thing that got his wife Susie upset and it was it was not getting a thoughtful gift on a special occasion any special occasion she wanted a thoughtful gift she expected to receive something decent uh, you know something fitting for the occasion not just and and by the way let me depart from the joke long enough to say my wife's the same way it's not about spending money on her it's about putting a little thought into it she can't stand for me to just buy a gift card and a box of chocolate, something just, just, you know, that I can just grab and walk off with. She wants me to think a little. So anyhow, <laughs> that sets this up nicely. But that upset his wife as well, and he knew that. So he asked all his friends, co-workers, clients, anybody that he happened to bump into, what would be a good anniversary present for a second anniversary? And finally, he settles on a big bouquet of flowers. Well, he wasn't willing to trust himself to pick out the flowers, thinking maybe he wouldn't get the right ones for the occasion, so he called up a local flower shop with strict instructions to deliver the biggest, most beautiful bouquet of flowers first thing in the morning with the following note, happy anniversary, year number two. The morning of the anniversary, Bill made sure Susie would be the one to answer the door as he waited anxiously in another room. After she answers the door, he hears her holler, What in God's name is this about? <laughs> Angrily holding up a note. As he comes into the room, she shows it to him. It says, Happy Anniversary, you're number two. <laughs> now, <laughs> you're not year. You're number two. Uh, <laughs> now, that... That fits nicely with where we're going to go with this this morning. Um, a wife should never feel like she's number two. Uh, that, that it's just the way it is. Uh, you need to understand that if I've learned anything, and I don't know that I've learned much, but if I've learned anything, it's that a husband and wife are supposed to be one. And that one is not complete. Uh, if you If you... Well, if it's not, you know, I mean, that didn't make sense, I guess. But you can't treat, uh, you can't treat your wife like she's number two, and, and, and uh, she shouldn't treat you like you're number two. You're both number one. You are one. <laughs> so we look at Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, we left off in verse 21. The Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. This type of submission is not uh, forced. 
it's not a military stop top submission where if you're in the army or well in any branch of the service and and your commanding officer tells you to do something you have to do it otherwise you'll be court-martialed or, or something worse um, and if you're in wartime you can face a firing squad it's that's not that's that is you know the military and marriage have nothing to do with one another you can draw some parallels you can and I don't want to get long-winded on this, but you can. I have seen scenarios where uh, a commander, um, r regardless whether it be a drill sergeant or, or a lieutenant or whatever, uh, a sergeant, uh, uh, you know, especially during wartime, a soldier who will not ask his, his men to do anything he won't do himself, that he won't lead into, um, if they see that his nature is to care about them and put his life on the line for them they may not like his orders but they'll come to respect and reverence him and fight alongside him and develop a, a camaraderie so there are some parallels you can draw but the military is a bad example for marriage because that's not what submit means um, this type of submission is a voluntary submission and it's done um, it's done in love it's all based on love the members of a church the reason I'm, I'm pointing this out as we get into this about marriage and children is because in the church there is a picture of Jesus and his bride and in your marriage there is a picture of Jesus and whether the, and the church is his bride but what I'm saying is the relationships inside the church the relationships between um, the, the, the quote unquote leaders of the church um, who Leader is another misleading word. Uh, a leader is supposed to lead by example and submit to serve in, in, in the, the serve the body. My hands serve this body. This head serves this body. In order to uh, in order to, to accomplish anything, they have to be in unity and work together. I don't get up in the morning and say, "Head, you're more important than the rest of this." I don't get up in the morning and even think like that. I just know that this body has to be united and work together and it has to take care of itself. <clears throat> so keeping that in mind, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of, of God just means that we're supposed to love one another and be willing to help one another and serve one another. And don't misuse the word submit. These are things, these are things that are done in love, and, and they're supposed to be a reminder of how Christ himself, when he was here, didn't set himself up as the most important person on the planet, even though he was, and still is, by the way. <laughs> no, he, he, he set himself up as a, uh, a leader by service, and that's what we're to do for each other, but it, 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 uh, this covers marriage as well because the church is a picture of marriage so that's why Paul sets it up this way in the church act this way and in your homes act this way because all of this is a picture of Jesus and that's who we're trying to honor and reverence okay wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord in other words just be willing to follow somebody who's following the Lord I mean um, just Submit means to voluntarily uh, follow somebody who's leading, and especially if they're you know leading by following, following the Lord Himself. If 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 a wife is submitting in this way, she's submitting directly to the Lord Himself. Um, that's not to put the husband on a pedestal because he doesn't belong on one. Um, the one man who belonged on one refused to step up on one. And that's why he's a worthy God to follow. Anyhow, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I know people misuse this. I know that I know that a lot of wives don't even like to hear this. But please hear all of it. Verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. That word Savior there is taken out of context that that. That can be misunderstood, but remember again that this is a picture. Christ is our Savior. He's also the groom. The body is the bride. In a marriage, the husband is not Jesus. He's just a picture of him. And he's not a Savior of anybody. He's just a picture of the Savior. Just as Christ is the Savior of the bride, 
Um, the groom is uh, the savior of the body. Um, it's, it's, it's the same picture. If you have trouble understanding that, then you need to look at Jesus because everything he did was a picture of what this is talking about. But you have to take it all in context. You can't just take that and run with it. So let's keep going. Verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Now, here's what's neat about that, and I want you to understand this. Our church is subject unto Christ, not unto me. The church is not subject unto their pastor. They follow him, but um, they're not subject to him. In fact, uh, when our church needs to make a decision, we have a meeting, and everybody has a say. And we submit to Christ, but we, we discuss the things that we need to discuss so that we know what Christ wants us to do. And the same is true in a marriage. Nowhere in here does it say for a wife just to, just to you know, bow her head and do everything he says to do. That's not what that means. Um, anyhow, um, I'll reread verse 24, and then I'm, I'm trying to get to something. It says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Now watch verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I think there'd be far less wives that struggle with the word submit if there were far less husbands that, str that didn't struggle with the word love. Um, it's, it's, it's misunderstood and most of the time ignored entirely. If a man loved his wife so much so that he was willing to lay down his life for her, I don't think she'd mind reading this in, in the context that it's intended. Um, I'll, I'll put it this way. Because I know that my Savior loved me enough to give His own life for me, to save me. I have no problem, none whatsoever, submitting myself to Him. Now, I, I say no problem. I, I do struggle with it, I mean, at times. We all do. But in my heart, I have no issues at all with submitting to Christ. Um, it's when my head gets in the way that I mess up. But in my heart, I know He is my Lord. He is my Savior. I am His. Uh, he is mine. And, I, and I'm going to do what He wants me to do. And when married people read this the way it's intended to be read, and when husbands will love their wives in this way, this, this word submission, doesn't. it's not near as bad. I don't think there's a wife in this world who would have a problem submitting to a husband who loved her the way Christ loved the church, um, who was willing to give his own life for her. I think that she would be honored to submit to a husband like that. The problem is there's not a lot of husbands like that. There's, there's some, thank God, but there's not a lot. Most, uh, most of the husbands I run into outside of Christianity um, they they no more know what love is than the man and the man. And this word love is important. Because if you don't love your wife that way, you can't expect anything out of her. And by the way, um, well, I'll come back. The husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself forth, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. When the body of Christ submits to the authority of Christ, they're cleansed and washed by the Word of God. That's what keeps us clean. If you don't study this and walk by it and do the things Paul's been saying prior even to this section, then you don't get that cleansing and you're not able to walk. Um, you're not able to have this unity we're supposed to have. And the, and the, and the fault is ours if we're not submitting ourselves to his authority and, follow, and, and, and cleaning ourselves by the washing of his word, then, then we're not going to have this relationship that we're trying to have with the Lord. The body of Christ has to do these things, the very things that we're, we're asking wives to do here, the body itself has to do for the Lord. So everything, again, everything we do in marriage is a picture of the relationship with Christ. I think God gave us marriage mostly to show us what this relationship is supposed to be like. Um, between us and, and our Creator through Christ. I, I really do. And, and I know He instituted it 
way back there in Genesis, but remember Christ is mentioned all the way from the beginning uh, where he's referenced. Uh, he's referenced multiple times in Genesis, and he even makes appearances as we've been learning on Wednesday nights. But anyhow, let me move on. Um, verse 27, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Remember, we're talking about marriage, but we're talking about marriage as it relates to the relationship between God and the church. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. A man who doesn't love his wife doesn't even love himself. And he ought not to even have a wife. To be honest with you, if he doesn't love her, he doesn't deserve her. Verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Again, Paul's drawing on references to um, Christ and the church, how Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, led it, instructed it, washed it, cleansed it, reconciled it, uh, able to present it spotless without blemish. I mean, these are all references to Jesus and the church. And so if we follow that example, marriage, uh, a marriage has um, its best chance to be successful and to honor God. Um, the reason marriages fail, by the way, the reason divorces are even a thing, is because people don't pattern their marriage after this section right here. In fact, most people cut this out of the Bible and ignore it. Your average person does not want to hear this. Um, some Christians don't even like it. Okay, um, this this is applicable to everyone. Everybody needs to know about this and understand it and follow it. But a non-Christian is not going to be able to. It's it's just it's not going to be uh, clear to them. They're not going they're not going to comprehend it. They can't because you have to know who Jesus is to understand how He loves us. And if you knew who He was and knew how He loved us, you'd follow Him and honor Him. So anyway, you you really. Uh, there are marriages that make it outside of Christianity, but they, it's 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 a wonder that they do. They, I mean, there are, but but they're not doing it right. This is the model, and, and, and this is based on this is based on Christ Himself. Um, he says, uh, "For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones." Remember, we're united, we're one. Um, the uh, the husband and wife are united as one. We're supposed to be in Christ, united in Christ. So in that unity, you have a hard time separating the two. I mean, if you love your body, it's just like this this head loving the rest of it. I mean, I've made this, I hope, clear. I hope I'm not making this more complicated than, than I meant to. I hope that this is pretty clear. But if it's not, we're, we're going to see it again in some other sections of the Bible. So I will move on. Um, he says, verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I think it's a mistake for, um, unless it's for a temporary amount of time, for, for you know, a variety of potential reasons, but I think it's a mistake for a husband to move his wife into his uh, parents' house or super close to his parents because he's not able to lead and, and, and not able to do things the way God intended if he's still living off of his parents. In fact, he's not even probably financially res uh, responsible enough to have a wife if he can't um, at least move out of the, uh, his parents' house and provide a place for him and his wife. Um, that's why, you know, Jesus made a point to say, I go to prepare a place for you. It's not that God didn't have a place to go. Um, the Lord wanted to make this distinction to teach us um, that he's, he's, he's preparing a place for us. Now this is a great mystery, and I don't claim to understand it. But it says, "For this," uh, and Paul says that too. For this, this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife; they two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. What Paul's saying here is, there's aspects of this that he didn't even understand. There's a, a lot of it that I don't understand. I take this on faith, and I trust what the Lord said to do. 
and I know that if if, uh, if I'm going to have a wife, and I do, but if I'm going to have a wife, I have to love her the way Christ loved me. And every time I feel I like get aggravated with her for anything, I need to remember how Christ must feel about me, um, because I don't I don't do as I'm supposed to do um, in my relationship with Him. And sometimes my wife don't do as she's supposed to do in her relationship with me. And, and rather than me just get mad at her or belittle her or, or uh, mistreat her in any way, form, or fashion, I need to go back to what this says and focus on what, what, what Jesus was trying to tell us about our relationship with him. I'll say this and I'm through. The better relationship you have with Jesus as a husband, the, the, the more you can expect to have a, a good relationship with a wife. If you're struggling with a relationship, a marital relationship, look at your relationship with Jesus and see where it is. Somebody wiser than me once said, and I think this is a good analogy and it's true, so I'll close with this. Somebody once said, if you're over here and your wife is over here and either one of you is going opposite direction from one another, then you're moving away from each other. If you're both headed to Jesus, he's up there. If you're both headed to Jesus, you cannot help but grow closer together. You can't help but to. So anyway, that's just some food for thought. Uh, we close out chapter 5, and we'll begin chapter 6, Lord willing, in the morning. Um, I hope that I've given you something that will help you. I think most of uh, the people that watch this know these things, but it's, it's good to be reminded of them and to teach them to our children and then their children. So anyhow, uh, and by the way, let me say, one of the big problems with the world today and, and this country in particular is that as this uh, as this relationship has been attacked and, and, and somewhat destroyed by the world uh, by, well, by the power of Satan um, you've seen nothing but chaos when when the when the marital relationship follows the picture Jesus gave us you don't see these issues the way we see them today um, it starts it starts in the home it starts with the relationship with Christ, and then it starts at home. And if we could get that figured out, this country would see a big change. All right, I love you. Have a wonderful day. We'll uh, see you tomorrow.